Hi, I'm Micah Halpern. Thank you for joining me today as I do some thinking out loud. Our first segment is called Background Briefing. The first thing I've been thinking about is the United Nations General Assembly, the centerpiece of the money pit located on the East River in New York City, is solely responsible for some of the most reprehensible decisions ever made in the name of foreign affairs. In brief, the General Assembly of the United Nations is a place where every nation of the world has a voice. It's a democratic organization in which non-democrats outnumber and outvoice lovers of freedom and equality. It's a forum in which the anti-democratic voices of the world are given sanction to beat up on those who cherish and respect freedom. The irony is sad. For New Yorkers, the annual gathering of leaders from 193 nations that takes place every year, two weeks every September, is not a perk. It's a headache. Traffic jams are constant. Black limos block intersections. They clog side streets. The only way to escape the traffic is to descend deep into the caverns of the subway. The idea for a formally structured body of United Nations was probably originally conceived by Immanuel Kant in his revolutionary work, Perpetual Peace, published in Germany in 1795. Kant believed that after the Napoleonic Wars, countries were destined to fight. In an effort to channel that destiny into a productive process, he proposed that countries organize into a forum to talk about issues and avoid war. Kant did not conceive of a single unifying government, but rather a place to avoid war and negotiate differences. The League of Nations, the precursor to the UN, was created after World War I at the Paris Peace Conference in 1919 for that very purpose. It had, at the time, significant support. 44 nations signed on, including 31 that had been involved in the war itself. In October of 1945, after World War II, the United Nations was established in place of the League of Nations. It was based, like its predecessors, on the principles of revol resolving conflict through talks. It began with 50 nations and has, over time, burgeoned to the present 193 member nations. Yes, talking is always preferred over shooting, but there are really uh, a platform for anti-democracy housed and celebrated in New York City, in the United States of America, protected by the democratic value of the Toast Nation. The United Nations in 2016 has become a platform for hate and a supporter of oppressive regimes. When all ideas are equal, the regimes that embrace evil and oppression share the podium with those who fight for freedom and equality. For example, the United Nations embraced the Palestinian cause way before the PLO, the Palestinian Liberation Organization, has, headed by Yasser Arafat, even considered swearing off terror. In 1974, the United Nations General Assembly voted to invite the PLO to sit and deliberate and participate in the GA. They were, by all definitions, a terror group. When Arafat came to the United Nations to address the GA in November of 1974, the Palestinian leader wore his customary garb, military uniform, keffiyeh, and a gun. UN protocol forced him to remove his weapon upon entering the chamber, but he kept his holster on, and everyone thought he still had his weapon. The dramatic impression was intentional. Former Iranian President Ahmadinejad is a prime example of a leader who blatantly stands up and attacks the United States and Israel in his speeches at the GA. His most famous speech was delivered in 2007. He attacked the United States at Columbia University and announced that there were no gays in Iran. Three years later, in 2010, standing at the podium in front of all the members of the General Assembly, he said that the United States was responsible for 9-11. In 2012, he said that Israel has no place in the Middle East. His speeches, all of them received huge applause and approbation from the many like-minded members of the GA. The attitude of the General Assembly towards Israel is the most deplorable of all deplorable attitudes. It adopts, and its actions and its voices votes upon it. When it comes to Israel, even the United leadership recognizes the injustice handed out in its halls. 
UN Secretary General Kofi Annan in 2006 at the 61st General Assembly meeting said, quote, on one side, supporters of Israel feel that it's harshly judged by standards that are not applied to its enemies. He continued, too often this is true, particularly in some UN bodies, unquote. Ban Ki-moon, also a Secretary General of the United Nations, said in August 2013 that, quote, unfortunately Israel has suffered from bias and sometimes even discrimination at the United Nations, unquote. Thankfully, though, the GA has no power. It has a big hall with acoustics that allow for shouts and screams to be heard by all and then telecast to the world by the ever-present media. Power in the United Nations sits within the Security Council, which, true to the Charter of the United Nations, is also set up in a very non-democratic fashion. Five permanent, the P5, members of the Security Council each have a veto, and they guide the direction of the Council. Every few years, temporary members, each representing a region, uh, rotate into the Security Council. They have votes, but their votes mean very little. It's the veto of the P5 that actually count. If the United Nations had a motto, it would be trite and cliché, and like most clichés, it would be true. The motto of the United Nations circa 2016 would be, the rest against the West. At the United Nations, the West is outnumbered numerically and theoretically. There is one positive thing that emerges out of the GA. That is the informal, unofficial, off-the-cuff meetings that take place in the halls the dining rooms, the corners of the buildings. There are meetings between advisors and leaders from all over the world. These meetings, often unplanned and just as often made to seem unplanned and informal, are held far from the cameras and the microphones. Often they plant the seeds for the resolution of conflicts and hot-button issues. The question is, do the small instances in which dialogue translates into peaceful resolution outweigh the greater instances of anti-democratic speech and action? I've also been thinking about the phrase Allahu Akbar. The Muslim terrorists shout it as they perform their acts of terror. Allahu Akbar as they stab someone with a knife. Allahu Akbar as they ram a car into crowds. Allahu Akbar as they blow themselves up together with everyone nearby. Ahmed Khan Rahami, the terrorist who assembled 11 bombs and planted four of them around New York City and New Jersey one balmy weekend in September, kept a journal full of thoughts and ramblings one set of words was repeated over and over, Allahu Akbar. The translation of Allahu Akbar is often rendered as God is great. But when you unpack the term, you quickly realize that Allahu Akbar is much more than a simple expression. After all, a simple expression would never do it when it's the last words a Muslim speaks while maiming and murdering innocent victims. When combined, Allahu Akbar does not actually mean God is great. And contrary to the common belief, it's not a phrase found in the Quran at all. In fact, it's not to be found anywhere in the holy book of Islam. The Arabic expression Allahu Akbar is called the takbir. The words Akbar and takbir use the same three-letter root, the K-B-R, means big or great in Arabic. Allahu Akbar is in fact part of the Muazin's call to prayer. It's a phrase used in times of happiness and joy, when the baby is born, during the pilgrimage to Mecca, called the Hajj, during festivals called the Eid. And yes, it is also the expression used in war and in jihad. The takbir, Allahu Akbar, is also found on flags, the flags of Iraq, Iran, and Afghanistan. The expression sends shivers down our spines. We understand how it was intended when the Egyptian Olympic judoka, Islam el Shanabi, uttered the words just before his match with Israeli Olympic judoka, Uri Sasson. He was not celebrating the birth of a child. It was a declaration of jihad, of war. It was a cry used to destroy the non-believer. But in the end, it was the Israeli who emerged victorious in that judo match. After 9-11, the FBI said that they found notes with the takbir among the possessions of the terrorists in Dulles, the crash site in Pennsylvania, and the Muhammad Atta's suitcase. In the suitcase, they even found a note that read, quote, when the confrontation begins, strike like champions who do not want to go back to this world. Shout Allahu Akbar, because this strikes fear in the hearts of the non-believers, unquote. The flight recorder of Flight 93 has the terrorists repeatedly shouting Allahu Akbar. Terrorists who perpetrated the Charlie Hebdo attack 
and the attack on the Bataclan Theater in Paris shouted the takbir. Terrorists all over Israel have used the takbir as their battle cry. The Hadith, which is a set of additional Muslim texts written after the Quran, describe how the Prophet Muhammad prepared to attack the Jews of Kaibar in 628. He begins the battle shouting, Allahu Akbar. The exact quote from the Hadith is, the Prophet set out for Kaibar and reached it at night. He used not to attack if he reached the people at night until day broke. So when the day dawned, the Jews came out with their bags and spades. When they saw the Prophet, they said, Muhammad and his army. And the Prophet said, Allahu Akbar. And Kaibar is ruined. For whenever we approach a nation, i.e. the enemy, to fight, then it will be a miserable morning for those who have been warned." Unquote. Allahu is the nominative form of the word Allah. Allah is the name of God in Islam. It is not God. There is a significant difference between the name of God and the word God. Akbar is the elative form of the root, KBR. KBR means great or big. In English, we have the positive, comparative, and superlative forms. Words like big, the positive, become bigger in the comparative, and then biggest in the superlative form. In Arabic, the elative is a combination of the comparative and superlative forms. That's the reason that, say, Akbar is often translated as greater and sometimes translated as greatest. Magnificent is not a good translation because it doesn't have the ER or the ES, which is necessary at the end of the word, which uh, gives the translation Allah is greater or superior to any other god. And that means something. So when someone tells you that the takbir and the jihad are about introspection and self-improvement, don't believe them. People who shout Allahu Akbar do not have peaceful intentions. Allahu Akbar, when used by Muslims in the presence of non-Muslims, is a call to war. Always was, always will be. Coming up next, points of view. Here's what some important voices have been talking about. First up is a column from the New York Times. It's entitled, Why the World Forgot the Israeli-Palestinian Conflict. And it was penned by Peter Baker, the Jerusalem bureau chief for the New York Times, proud husband of Susan Glazer, editor of Politico. It was published September 22, 2016. Baker has been writing for the Washington Post and then for the New York Times for decades. This piece asks, a serious question as to why the Israeli-Palestinian issue is no longer a central issue for the world. Baker describes Netanyahu and Abbas's presentations before the United Nations General Assembly. This is how he begins his column. They took the stage, one after the other, two aging actors in a long-running drama that has begun to lose its audience. As the Israeli and Palestinian leaders recited their lines in the Grand Hall of the United Nations General Assembly on Thursday, many in the orchestra seats recognized the script. Heinous crimes charged Mahmoud Abbas, the Palestinian president. Historic catastrophe, fanaticism countered Benjamin Netanyahu, the Israeli prime minister. Inhumanity. Then Baker tries to explain the players and their points of view. But there's really nothing there. He continues. Mr. Abbas and Mr. Netanyahu have been at this for so long that between them, they have addressed the world body 19 times, every year cajoling, lecturing, warning, and guilt-tripping the international community into seeing their side of the bloody struggle between their two peoples. Their speeches are filled with grievance and bristling with resentment. As they have summoned the ghosts of history from hundreds and even thousands of years ago to make their case, Baker shows that there was always some excitement around their UN speeches, but not this year. He writes, while each year finds some new twist, often nuanced, sometimes incendiary, the argument has been running long enough that the world has begun to move on. Where the Israeli-Palestinian conflict once dominated the annual meeting of the United Nations, this year it has become a sideshow as Mr. Netanyahu and Mr. Abbas compete for attention against seemingly more urgent crises like the civil war in Syria and the threat from the Islamic State. The rest of the column is dedicated to the blah blah of international politics and that the Israeli and the Palestinians are no longer in the center of things. And this is how Baker concludes. Still, if the diplomats were not ready to embrace Israel, they were also focused elsewhere. It did not go unnoticed in Jerusalem that Mr. Obama devoted just one sentence to the Israeli-Palestinian issue in his final United Nations speech 
as president, compared with some years when the topic took up to a quarter of his address. Next year, of course, Mr. Obama will be gone, but Mr. Abbas and Mr. Netanyahu might very well be back. He probably, he's probably correct. The theme and the tune stay the same, even when the people are not listening. Second up is a column from a Muslim website dedicated to helping Muslims in the West struggle with essential issues. The website is called Muslim Matters. And the website address is www.muslimmatters.com. This column is called Why We Will Not Falter. And it was published on September 20th, 2016. The column is written by Esma Bengabsi. The website is set up to please Allah by providing a platform for Orthodox thought leaders to effect positive change, to establish a safe online community which shares and discusses relevant issues along with practical solutions shaped by the experiences and viewpoints of its writers. The author is concerned that because of the recent terror attacks, Muslims will be misunderstood as supporting terror. This is in the context of the New York City and New Jersey bombings in September. The author asks, today we've witnessed the identification and arrest of the man who was announced responsible for the bombings in New York and New Jersey, a Muslim. To our disappointment, a Muslim again we had that hope that we always have when we hear of yet another violent tragedy in our nation. Please don't be a Muslim. The scenarios ran through our heads. The hate crimes, the raids by police officers, the increased surveillance on our mosques. Yet we had hope that it wouldn't be a Muslim. We had hope it would be some young white boy who would be dismissed as mentally ill and life would go on. We had hope and once we saw the name Ahmad in our phones, alerts, and news headlines, the hope was crushed. The author proceeds to ask now that we know that the terrorist was a Muslim, how should we react? Again, the hyper-caution overwhelmed us. How will we stay safe? Can Islamophobia really get any worse? What will the news headlines say? How will they attribute this heinous act to all Muslims this time? The author concludes and says there is hope. Sisters and brothers, let us not falter. We must not, cannot, and will not falter. Let us not feel exhausted or exasperated. Let us not hesitate for a moment as we refresh our faith each day and wholeheartedly rejuvenate our commitment publicly and privately to the most powerful exalted is he. Let us bask in the glory of this honor that our creator has bestowed upon us. Let us seize these opportunities, fulfill our duties, and prepare for the ease that Al-Haq, the truth, has promised us is soon to come. Ben Gabsi is raising a very good point. The Muslim community is terrorized by the terror. They do not know how to respond. They know that the terror is wrong. Muslim leadership needs to now channel this into guiding this trauma into something more positive and teaching their community. Only then will they be able to confront the evil from within. Coming up, Commentary through cartoons, where pictures tell the story. I want to share three cartoons today. They're all by the same British cartoonist, Patrick Chaput. He draws for the British paper, The Globe, as well as the international New York Times. The first cartoon comes from The Globe. It was published on September 25th, 2016. The title of the cartoon is Massive Data Breach at Yahoo. A programmer is standing in front of the CEO of Yahoo, and his computer report says on the screen, 500 million accounts hacked. He says to his supervisor, the good news, we still have 500 million users. The humor here is profound. I asked the very same question when I heard about the attack. I could not believe that Yahoo still has half a billion viewers. Second up is a cartoon called Syria Truce is Over. This one is published in the International New York Times on September 24, 2016. The cartoon takes place in Syria. A man and a woman are looking as a bomb exploded on a table. The U.S. and Russian fighter jets fly away. The woman says about the table, it was the negotiating table. In other words, the Russians and the U.S. blew up the ceasefire. This last cartoon is entitled, Life Goes On in New York City, and it was published in the International New York Times on September 21st, 2016. The cartoon portrays New Yorkers going about their business 
as counter-terror teams sweep for terrorists. This is perfect, a perfect portrayal of what really happens in New York City, that despite the crisis, things go on as normal. In a moment, my own perspective and a few predictions. Recently, Iran introduced their first credit card. There are three different categories for the credit card, the $3,000 limit, a $10,000 limit, and a $15,000 limit. Iran is easing the credit cards into their country in the hope that it will help stimulate the economy, especially the banking system. The country needs to jumpstart its internal port purchases. But there's an important issue still at hand. Islam rejects the concept of interest, which is exactly how credit cards work. That's the reason Iran and other Islamic countries have until now shunned the credit card. Is business trumping religion in Iran? I wonder how long credit cards will last there. Recently, a federal court in Alexandria, Virginia, convicted Ardit Farizi of hacking for ISIS. This is the first case in which a person has been convicted of hacking and helping a terror group. Farizi is a native of Kosovo and was arrested in Malaysia. From there, he was extradited to the United States to stand trial. Farizi stole the records of over 100,000 people from a retailer in the United States and identified 1,351 U.S. members of the military and federal employees to be targeted by ISIS. He knew that, the ISIS, that ISIS was going to attack them, quote, hit them hard. He pleaded guilty to the charges. Farizi admitted to stealing the, pers uh, the personally identifiable information of over 1,000 U.S. service members and federal employees and providing it to ISIS with the understanding that they would incite terrorist attacks against those individuals. ISIS is working hard to attack the U.S and attack them in as many ways as possible. Israel launched a spy satellite, the OFEC-11, recently. The satellite launch brings the total of Israeli spy satellites to 10, as far as I can count. When the spy satellite was launched, it was malfunctioning. That's a problem, because the satellite was unable to send pictures back to Earth to be analyzed by the Israeli defense and intelligence teams. But nine days later, we got a report that the OFEC 11 was online and transmitting very clear pictures. The coming online of the satellite allowed the Israeli teams to breathe a deep breath of relief. It's very hard to fix a satellite from Earth, but it seems that that's exactly what they did. Simon Kolas, the British ambassador to Saudi Arabia, recently converted to Islam. Kolas and his wife, who was of Syrian descent and is also a Muslim, performed the Hajj, the pilgrimage to Mecca. The Saudi press has been filled with compliments for Kolis. There have been a ripple effect throughout the rest of the Arabic world. Kolis is explaining his decision. He said that he spent the last 30 years living in Muslim countries. And although conversion is a personal matter, Kolis' conversion is clearly important to the Arabic world. And they are literally holding up Kolis as a hero within Islam. On the other hand, I am certain the people in Whitehall, the centerpiece of the foreign British Foreign Office are very concerned about this very public conversion and the attention it's getting in the press throughout the world. We've been thinking out loud about a lot today. Now that you know what I've been thinking, let me know what you're thinking. Email me at micah at jbstv.org. Tweet me at Micah Halpern. Tell me what you think. Before we end, let me leave you with one picante piece of information. Did you know that the name of God, Allah in Arabic, is the same name of God in Hebrew? El, Muslims and Jews worship the same God. In Hebrew, there are many names of God. One name that Jews use is Hashem, which of course means the name. We actually do not utter the actual name, the four-letter name, the yud ke vav ke, or as it's referred to, the ineffable, which means the non-mentionable. Or in academic terms, it's called the tetronomogram. The four-letter name of God is never uttered, even when it's written in the Torah or in prayer. We replace it with another name. We replace it with the word master or other Shem. The name God is simply a Middle German translation of a description of God. It means good. It's a description of Hashem that God is all good. Gut in German, the German word gut, and from there into the English word God. Thank you for thinking out loud with me, Micah Halpern. Let's think out loud again next week on JBS. We 
would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS, the Jewish Broadcasting Service, with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the JBS homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM, to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.